really three types of election polls that we deal with in the industry. One is those conducted for political parties, and they aren't for the public. In fact, Scott will confirm that the vast bulk of polling that's done in Canada uh, is not released to the public. So when we talk about uh, political polls and elections, a huge amount of those polls are not, are not released. They're really for strategy in the back rooms. And you as the public, or as the attentive public, I should say, you do see some polls, but those are the very small minority. But those, but there are polls that are conducted for political parties. Secondly, there are academic surveys, and some of you are political science students, no doubt working in, in uh, research methods courses, and you might want to access some of those, those uh, databases. One of the big ones is the Canadian Election Study out of... Uh, for when I was studying there out of Carleton University, and now I'm not sure where, I think McGill is, is where much of the work is done now. But that's accessible, the Canadian election study. It's a massive study done every after every, during and after every election. But those done for the media and released to the public are the third type of election polls. And that's what I'm going to focus on today in my discussion. So about the, in terms of media coverage and, and polling, really in Canada it goes back to the 1940s is when we first started really seeing the media doing coverage of election polls. And, and George Gallup was the guy who brought in the, the Gallup poll. Some of you would know the name Gallup poll, but the Gallup poll was sort of the industry standard type poll, both in the United States along with Starch Roper and a few others. But the, in Canada, the, the Gallup poll came over into our country about 1940, 41. And the person who brought it over was Saul Ray. Saul Ray is the father of Bob Ray, who was the past premier of, the, of, of, on, of Ontario and the, the interim leader of the Liberals for a while. But the, the, the Gallup poll was the first in the 1940s. In the 1950s, we started to see a little bit more polling being released, in, uh, um, both in the Toronto newspapers, Montreal newspapers, and, and nationwide. If you go through the, the archives of the Winnipeg Free Press, you will see polls that were released, but the, usually you'd only see maybe one poll you might see some regional things, but it wasn't, it wasn't bread and butter during elections. There is talk, if you read Claire Hoy's book called Margin of Error, Claire Hoy is sort of like the, the Charles Adler of, of, uh, of Ontario print news, but uh, uh, Claire Hoy in the 1980s wrote a book called Margin of Error, and it's actually quite an interesting book. It was one of the few books written in the 80s about polling and, and what was happening in Canada, but he claims that the 1957, the polls misled Canadians into thinking that the that the, the, the long-standing liberals, the long-governing liberals, were going to win the election. When in fact, Claire Hoy's got the story wrong. If you go through the newspaper archives, the coverage of that period, in fact, McLean's didn't do any polling. McLean's uh, uh, with Bruce Hutchinson did not do any polling. They just talked about the feeling of what was happening across Canada. So I went through all the McLean's issues. That's how exciting my life is, reading 50-year-old McLean's magazines. But I went, went through them, and there's not a single poll covered in the McLean's magazine. In fact, if you go through the Toronto Star and some of the Winnipeg Free Press coverage, I, I didn't go to the Winnipeg Tribune, but the Winnipeg Free Press coverage did actually report on a couple of polls which were showing, according to Gallup, that in Ontario and Toronto in particular, there was a move going on that could be discerned in the numbers towards Stephen Baker and the Progressive Conservatives in the 1950s. So, in fact, uh, the polls as far back as the 1950s were not misleading people, as Claire Hoy wants us to think, but was actually, they were actually indicating something that was going to be happening. So in the 1960s, I, uh, we were doing a, a presentation at McNally Robinson, and I was explaining why I have that picture of Pierre Trudeau with the elastic band there. I always have that picture there just because I like the picture. It has nothing to do with polls, but just the idea of Pierre Trudeau shooting elastic band. But during the, the 1965 to 79, we only saw two or three national polls each election. 1984 election, we started seeing some more polls being released, and six firms were releasing national polls. And to get a, to get a sense of how they're really picking up in numbers, 2008, we saw 113 national polls. So now we're in a period in which we are almost on a daily basis, and we saw during the 2011 election a slight decline, but 76 national polls. So we as, as, as political scientists, as, uh, as, as the attentive public, when we're watching these polls, it's no longer six, six weeks before a campaign or three weeks before a campaign looking at the tea leaves as to who, who might be winning, but now it's on a daily basis during a, a federal campaign. And uh, um, my, my friend Scott Mackay will tell you uh, campaigns are like baseball games, and, and if you're 
into the beginning of a, of a baseball game that you might be thinking that you've got the score, but in fact there's a number, number of weeks still to go. And that's the case right now. We're looking at provincial polls in Manitoba about where is Pallister compared to Rana Bakari of the Liberals compared to Selinger. It's looking very bad for the NDP, as you all know. They're in third place. They're, they're very far back. Uh, they're, they're, I would say that there are probably a handful of safe seats for the NDP right now. But still, we haven't even seen the campaign start. So I would still say that, there, that we don't know what's going to happen in the provincial election. But, you know, but right now, if an election were held today, the, the, uh, um, the NDP would be spanked. So if we talk about how reliable our polls and, and reasons for failure, because they're like airplanes, right? We only get to hear the news about the crashes. Nobody cares about the airplanes that are on time. So I'm just going to back up here. There have been some failures in terms of polls and, and some very public failures, and, and the polling industry continues to have to explain itself. But there are some reasons why we have trouble predicting things sometimes based on polling. One is the, the low turnouts. When we have low turnouts, when you're talking to the public, you don't know if you're talking to the public that's going to be turning out to vote, or are you talking to people in the public who, who will be turning out to vote. So when you have a low turnout, and it's particularly significant in municipal elections when even a minority are turning out to vote, you're trying to get a sense of how is it going to turn out on election day. It's very difficult to figure things out. So if you compare 1984, we had 75 percent of adults voting, so it was easier to do a, a sense of what was happening in the public compared to 61 percent in 2011. And I think if my numbers are right, uh, the, the most recent election it was quite close to 70 percent. So a higher turnout meant that the polls would probably be a little bit more accurate. Also, the data weighting, that, that is, we in the polling industry or, or those in the polling industry, you try to get a sense of the public numbers, but you will have distortions in your samples of what's going on out there. So if you're underrepresenting young people or underrepresenting those who will be voting, then you can have distortions. And if you have the in incorrect weighting of that data to make it reflect the public, then there are problems. One of the, one of the things that happened in British Columbia when the pollsters inaccurately called Adrian Dix's NDP to win is sort of an opposite thing is one of the one of the things Eric Grenier was commenting on with the CBC was was the weighting was so good in terms of getting the the numbers right on on what the the sample was reflecting the the population it was so good that it was over representing the young people that young people were not turning out to vote so it's one thing to have a representative sample it's another thing to have a representative sample of those who are going to be voting one of the things in the 2014 civic election, you might remember Judy, Judy Wasilisalis, a Carleton University graduate, by the way. Judy Wasilisalis, she, uh, um, we all expected her to win. The polling numbers showed that she was going to win. And in fact, one of the last of the big polls, there were only just a few done during that municipal election. The last poll that really was released was around the time of the advanced polls. And if you look at the advanced, I'm not saying opinion polls, the advanced polls, the, the voters, the voting ahead of time. If you compare the, the advanced polls, those numbers, to the poll that came out, I think it was Prober, it might have been CJOB's, it was CJOB's poll, those numbers reflected what was in the advanced voting numbers. So the polls weren't wrong, it was just that the dial moved as we got to election day when Brian Bowman won that election. So reasons for failure, I've just got a few more minutes. Let me just go through a few things. Is, is uh, respondents were confused sometimes now polling with sales calls, and that's an issue that, that people have to deal with. Uh, you all know that when you answer the phone and you get that pause, not all pollsters use the auto dialer, but when you get that pause, many people do hang up. Even my kids uh, um, do that on a regular basis, even when they're 12 years old. So one of the things, too, is, to, is, is cell phones. By 2013, 83% of households had a cell phone. One in five relied exclusively on a cell phone for telephone communications. And in households with those under the age of 35, 60% use cell phones exclusively. So if you're trying to get a sense of certain households of where they're voting, the, 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 the challenge is using, uh, trying to reach people on their cell phones. And I'm sure Scott has, has some perspectives on that. And then some of the new, the new technologies we're seeing in the polling industry, the uh, online polling. Now, when people say, well, how can you have a representative sample with an online poll? We go back to Gallup and Starch and, and Crossman during the 1930s. 
They didn't do landline telephone polling. They didn't do random calling across the United States to get a sense of where the electorate was in the 1936 federal uh, uh, presidential election. What they did is they went out with quotas and they pulled together specific characteristics of the voting population in the United States and they built what, be, what they called in the Pulse of Democracy by Gallup in the 1940 book, they built what was called a mini electorate. So it's not a random sample, but it's a mini electorate which it contains all the key components of the big United States electorate. So in many ways, when we talk about online polls, they aren't random polls and they can't be talked about with a margin of error because those sorts of things, for those taking research methods courses, you would know this, that those margins of errors are based on probability. So. When you see an online poll, you shouldn't be seeing a margin of error calculation of plus or minus 2% or 3%. But nevertheless, it doesn't mean that they're unreliable. It means that they, they're based, if they're done properly by the, some of the bigger firms, it means they've pulled together a proper electorate, a mini electorate of what the big electorate is about. The other one is inter, inter, uh, interactive voice response. Uh, Main Street poll just did a poll, came out yesterday, which showed Pallister's PCs are pulling ahead of both the, the NDP and the Liberals by even greater margins than other polls. Uh, ECOS is another one that does, does um, IVR. Inter and, and those have to be very short polls. You can't put somebody on one of those things for 10 or 15 minutes like the more traditional telephone polls. But they have been fairly, fairly accurate over the past number of years. And one of the advantages of them is they're less expensive, they can be done very quickly, and you can do a thousand interviews or more in one night. The problem with that is you might not have a properly representative sample. How are we, Richard? Good, three minutes, just in time. Or less. Okay, the 2011 federal election, I'm just going to go quickly over some of the results. Here, this is tracking, this is just from Wikipedia, but it tracks all the polls that were done, each slice along the way, and you can see the numbers shifted during the 2011 election, and you can see the NDP surge under Jack Layton uh, towards the end. Now, in terms of how accurate was the polling, um, this is taking the polls that were done just prior to Election Day, not a prior, month prior or three weeks prior. But here, if you look at the Conservative Party results, you can see that the, um, the overall result is just under 40% was the actual result. Everybody else except Compass Research, which is an, I sometimes have questions about their, their work, but almost every one of the companies that was releasing a poll a day or two or three before the election, just a behind by a couple of points or just off by a couple of points. In terms of the 2015 election, we also saw a surge of the Liberals, not the NDP. Not as dramatic, but still fairly, fairly strong. And you can see there was a big surge, uh, we all know that in this room, that the Liberals surged towards the end. But the, you look at how accurate were the polls, uh, the, the polling firms. Well, let's compare the Liberal results. Liberals, the actual voting was 39.5%, just under 40%, and everybody else was just a few points off in calling the Liberals um, within, within. So, and these were with different methodologies, some with telephone methodologies, some with IVR, some with online polling. So the methodology didn't determine that you would be far off from the actual results. So the pollsters were fairly, fairly close on the, um, on the election, and I think if they'd been able to poll actually on election day with that Liberal surge, they would have been even more accurate. But they couldn't do the polling on election day. Where things really fell apart, and this is just my last comments here, seat projections. When we start pulling polling data together, uh, creating algorithms based on the shift and past history of different regions for parties, we're starting to get out of the world of polling into more predictive um, uh, modeling. And the pollsters um, not the pollsters, but those who are using polling numbers to model what the projections would be, would be um, none of them predicted a majority victory for the Liberals. Um, uh, what, what, um, Main Street polling, uh, they claimed that they called that it would be a majority uh, um, um, outcome for the Liberals. They claim they're the only ones who did. I saw no evidence before that. They, they claim it. I, I, I haven't seen that. So, so the, th the companies like uh, ECOS and, and the Laurier Institute and Eric Grenier does this 30800.com, uh, none of them predicted, using the models of, of seat projections, none of them predicted a majority for the Liberals. And they, the same thing, the models didn't work for predicting a conservative majority in the previous elections. So uh, that's just a round the world trip in, in uh, 14 and a half minutes. So thanks very much.
Well, there have been complaints for, for decades about the role of media during elections, uh, the use of polls, and I, I think Mary Agnes is, is right when she says that journalists are, are, are more professional in their treatment of polls. I remember in 1984, uh, results in, in the brand new Winnipeg Sun at the time uh, showing where Manitoba was at, uh, on a certain provincial poll and what they had taken was just a tiny slice of a national poll. It was based, conclusions based on, on 90 people. Now, you know, one of the things that one term we haven't used here but which is lurking in the background in our conversation is strategic voting. And strategic voting is where people make a choice in part because they have knowledge as to what uh, what are the parties that have a chance to form or to win to win a victory? And we do know that when you when a voter knows the the voting numbers, the the polling numbers can make a proper choice. And I think there was strategic voting in the last federal election as people thought which party can throw the conservatives out. Uh, so so a strategic voting I think is a critically important thing. I, I do want to riff a little bit on on John Harvard and your comments as before he died. He and I had an argument by email as to whether Stephen Fletcher would be able to hold Charleswood. And I said, well, that's crazy, John, that, that uh, everybody knows that Stephen Fletcher is going to hold that, that seat. And so John Harvard had the, the last word with me. I, th I think it's 24 hours now, but the uh, federal regulatory, uh, the, you can't do, unlike in the United States, you can't do exit polls in, in, in Canada during a federal election. So there are some constraints. They have been challenged. Uh, having a bigger period of time before an election, so it's it's difficult. I, I'm not sure if I if I bought. And Jim and I used to argue all the time in Tom Peterson's class and other classes. So this is a 40-year-old discussion we're having on a number of things. But but I'm not sure that the that the rise of polls is the cause of the the rise of cynicism in, in politics. I think it it might just be uh, 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 synchronized with it. I think, you know, the election of Obama, whether you like Obama or not, was a politics of hope. I think, I think, the, the, I think uh, Bowman's election in Winnipeg, I think, was the politics of hope. I don't think it was people's uh, uh, being nasty or against things. I think they voted for Bowman because they wanted some sort of positive thing, whether, whether you like Bowman or not. The other thing, too, is I, I think Justin Trudeau, I think, was the politics of hope. And I think people, some people are turned off, the conservatives, because they're a politics of, of uh, protecting your pocketbook. That's how they campaigned, mm -hmm. and politics to, to go against terrorism. Now, those are, are strong positions for the conservatives to hold, but I think Trudeau, in many ways, won better than the NDP in the last election because it was a politics of, of positivism, whether you liked them or not is a different thing. So